I have no idea. You know, there's no. Oh. We're not on here, anyways. Tracy Weiner's in. Tessa Sobolisky. City Planner. Paul Henbury, whoever that is. Adam Smith. Trevor Plunquist. iPad 2, excuse me, whomever is listed as iPad 2, you are on, um, you are not muted at this time. If I could ask you to mute your microphone, thank you. Okay, we're in, thank you. You okay. Steve comes in. Hi, Ray. It's John. Can you hear me? I can. I can, John. Go ahead. Thank you. Just making sure. Okay. Member John McDougall, while we have um, the screen, may you please just ensure that your microphone is, is on? Sure. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Okay. Recording in progress.
there. Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Ray Pearson. I'll be the chair tonight for the tonight's meeting. And as I call the meeting to order, it's 6 p.m. And I'll uh, start with the preamble here and our land acknowledgement. As we gather, we recognize that we are on Treaty 3 lands, which are steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nations and Métis people today. We continue to be thankful for the partnerships with our Indigenous people. This is a hearing of the Kenora Planning Advisory Committee and Committee of Adjustment for the City of Kenora. The committee members have been appointed by Council to consider applications for minor variances, consents, plans of subdivisions, and condominium descriptions within the jurisdiction of the Planning Act. The applicants or agents will be given an opportunity to speak on behalf of their submissions and to respond to questions arising from the discussion of these applications. Interested members of the public will be given an opportunity to speak in favor of or opposition to the applications being dealt with at these hearings. Prior to calling the meeting to order, please ensure that your microphone is on mute. Should you be joining the meeting with video, please be mindful of what is in your background. Be respectful of others throughout the meeting if at any time you wish to leave the meeting, you are free to do so by simply clicking on end call at the bottom of your screen. If you're on a landline, you may hang up at any time. However, please do not interrupt the meeting to inform of your dismissal. Please note this meeting is being recorded and by continuing to be in the meeting, you're consenting to be recorded. Tap leave meeting to opt out and exit the session. When it is time for public comments, I will ask those interested to raise their hand to the screen or alternatively to use the raise hand function of Zoom. I will address the participant by name that appears on your screen or the name that was used to register for this virtual PAC meeting. Once your name has been called, please then unmute your microphone and or your telephone. All persons addressing the committee shall state their full names and mailing address must direct their comments through myself, the chair. Decisions will be mailed or emails to the applicant, agent, and to all other interested parties who have provided their mailing address and or email address to the secretary treasurer at mshaw at kenora.ca. Also, a notice of adjourned application or possible local planning appeal tribunal hearing will also be provided to those who have made a written request form via email to the secretary treasurer Ms. at Melissa Shaw, M. Shaw, sorry, at uh, Kenora.ca. The decision and or any conditions imposed by the committee can be appealed to the Ontario Land Tribunal, OLT. The notice of appeal for a minor variance application must be filed with the secretary treasurer within a 20 day, 20 days of making the decision the notice of appeal for a land division application must be filed with the secretary treasurer within 20 days of the mailing of the notice. The secretary treasurer tonight for the Kenora Planning Advisory Committee is Melissa Shaw. The city planner is Kevin Sumner. The manager of development services is Adam Smith. And the minute taker is Tess Sabisky. I will ask the secretary treasurer if there's any additions to the agenda. I have none. None, okay. I'll ask the committee if there is any declaration of interest by a member for this meeting or a meeting at which a member was not present. Okay, seeing none. Um, uh, with that, uh, Melissa, is uh, Tannis with us here? I don't see her on my screen. Mr. Chair, we do only have the three members this evening, which as per our terms of reference is quorum. Yeah, okay. Fair enough. Um, I'll ask the committee uh, for adoption of the minutes of the pre previous mini, uh, minutes. Are there any comments or questions? 
John, John, two Johns. Seeing none, okay. Minutes are approved. And I'll ask the Secretary Treasurer, is there any uh, additional correspondence relating to the applications? I did just want to make mention that with respect to application for draft plan of subdivision D102112, there was supplementary information sent on Monday, September 20th, which was a revised planning rationale as submitted or as prepared by Kenora Resource Consultants. And then today on September 21st, a draft plan of subdivision certified by an Ontario land surveyor was circulated. So that was circulated both to the planning advisory committee members and to the public. Okay, I received that. Did you guys get that, John? The two Johns? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. So then we'll move ahead with the uh, first application, application D102110, application for consent. And with that, I believe Ms. Maya will be the agent representing that. Yes, good evening. I'm the agent so representing um, the applicants in this matter. Okay, Kimberly, go ahead. Um, I don't know if Kevin would like to um, do his planning report first, or would you like me to make submissions first? I'd like you to go ahead first, please. Okay. Um, so, the this is simply put, this is an application by a neighboring landowner. Um, look, the properties are located on Coney Island, 792 and 794 Coney Island. Um, the, the applicant is um, Nicholas Logan and Christine Skeen, um, the owners of the property, which is the subject of a potential consent application to do a lot addition to property owned by um, Kumpsty, um, Mr. Kumpsty. And um, the purpose of the application is to, a small portion of the property owned by Nicholas Logan and Christine Skeen um, to, to be severed off and added to the neighboring property owned by Mr. Logan. Um, and this is for the purpose of, um, there's a dock located on the property which currently encroaches on the Logan property, sorry, on the Cumsty property that currently encroaches on the Cumsty, sorry, on the <laughs> on the Comstie property that encroaches on the Logan property. Um, so the purpose of this is to bring that into compliance and save that, um, that encroachment. Um, there also is um, an application which will be heard next month for a minor variance with respect to the, um, the, the Comstie property, which um, I'm sure will come up in Kevin's, um, in Mr. Sumner's sorry, um, report coming up. Um, but again, the purpose is to bring this into compliance and to um, to rectify that um, encroachment on to, with respect to the dock onto from the Cumsey property onto the Logan property. Anyway, just talked about it. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, city planner, would you like to give your report? Yes, I can. Uh, so uh, the. Uh, what we have is an application for consent uh, lot addition, so there will be no new crea creation of any new lots. Uh, it is severing a portion of uh, the property owned by um, Mr. Logan and Ms. Skeen uh, and adding that, as Ms. May uh, uh, mentioned, to uh, the adjacent property. Uh, so uh, both these properties are located on the eastern shore of Coney Island. Uh, both Access to both lots is water only. And there is seasonal, seasonal, seasonal municipal water and no municipal service uh, to either property. Uh, 794 Coney Island is approximately 1.26 hectares in area and undeveloped with shoreline frontage on both the north and south shores of the point on land of which it is situated. Lot 792 is approximately 0 0.7 hectares in area and developed with a single detached dwelling, but has no shoreline frontage at the southern corner of the property. A dock and shoreline structures have been built for 792 Coney Island that, uh, as Ms. May uh, mentioned, uh, encroach over the property line uh, at present onto the property at 794 Coney Island. Uh, so uh, in regards to consistency with legislative policy and city directives, uh, the provincial policy statement, uh, the application is generally consistent with the policies of the provincial policy statement, which promotes managing and directing land use to achieve efficient and resilient development of land and land use patterns. 
Uh, policy 1.1.5 states that development that is compatible with the rural landscape and can be sustained by rural service levels should be promoted. In regards to the City of Kenora official plan, the land use designation of the subject properties is rural area, which provides for a variety of agricultural, residential, industrial, commercial, recreational, tourism, and open space uses. All adjacent properties are also designated as rural area. Uh, the official plan is silent on the subject of using consent to sever small portions of property for realignment of property boundaries, which doesn't result in the creation of a new lot. And you can see an image in my report uh, illustrating uh, the current property lines and the official plan mapping. In regards to the zoning bylaw, number 101-2015, uh, both the property being severed and the property being added to our zoned RR, Rural Residential Zone, Development in the RR zone is subject to the regulations of section 4.5 of the zoning bylaw number 101-2015. Adjacent properties are also zoned RR. Lots in the RR zone must have a minimum lot frontage of 61 meters and a minimum lot area of one hectare. The existing lot at 792 Coney Island is currently smaller and has less than the minimum required frontage and lot area, but the proposed lot addition will bring it closer to conforming for both regulations. The property at 794 Coney Island will continue to exceed the minimum area and frontage requirements following the proposed severance. A dock and shoreline structure, as I mentioned, at uh, 792 Coney Island appear to have been constructed so as to encroach on both neighboring shoreline properties. The dock was legally permitted in 1989 and appears to be legally non-complying with the zoning regulation. Uh, there is no record of permits being issued for the other structures that appear to consist of a shoreline deck and accessory structure. Uh, bringing the deck and accessory structure into compliance with the zoning bylaw will require the separate application for minor variance, which Ms. May uh, already mentioned, uh, to reduce the required side yard setbacks and enable lawful permitting of the, those accessory structures. Uh, we circulated the proposed consent for uh, internal uh, interdepartmental and agency circulation. Uh, the only comments that we received uh, expressing uh, any uh, comments was from uh, Synergy North, uh, who noted that they did have no concerns, but noted that they have an overhead pole line that runs through the properties. Uh, and pursuant to the provisions of section 46 of the Electricity Act, there exists materials and equipment necessary to distribute electricity to the properties. SNC maintains the right to access such equipment and materials in order to provide electrical service until such time as the electrical service is no longer required as determined by SNC. This overhead pole provides service to several customers not within registered easements and no other encumbrances exist. In terms of public comments, uh, circulation of the notice uh, was uh, completed in accordance with section 53 of the Planning Act. Um, up, and the public hearing is being uh, held here tonight. And as of the date of the report and subsequent to that, uh, there's no public comments have been received in regards to this application. Therefore, it's my evaluation that if approved, the application will allow the severance of a small parcel from the subject property to add to the neighboring property, resulting in the net creation of no new lots. This additional parcel will bring the neighboring, neighboring lot closer to conforming with, with the zoning bylaw and will correct an existing encroachment. A separate application for minor variants will be required to bring that shoreline deck and accessory structure into compliance. The application is supported by the policies of both the provincial policy statement and the official plan. I note for the record in my report, the legislative framework for consent approval. Um, and then we'll move on to the recommendation, which is that application D10-21-10 for consent for lot severance on property located at 794 Coney Island and legally described as pin 42162-0160 city of Kenora and the addition of the severed parcel to the property located at 792 Coney Island and legally described as PIN 42162-0159, City of Kenora, be approved, and provisional consent grant be granted subject to the following. One, that the original executed transfer slash deed of land form, a duplicate original, and one photocopy for city records be provided for each parcel. Two, a schedule to the transfer slash deed of land form on which is set out the entire legal description of the PINs in question, and containing the names of the parties indicated on page one of the transfer slash deed of land forms be provided for each parcel. Three, that the land be transferred for lot addition, lands to be transferred for lot addition be surveyed and described on a reference plan, and that a draft is provided to the planning department for pre-approval. 
four, three original copies and one PDF copy of the reference plan of survey bearing the land registry office res registration number and signatures as evidence of deposit therein and illustrating the parts to which the consent approval relates, which must show in general the same area and dimensions as the sketch forming parts of the application be provided. Five, that the payment of any outstanding taxes, including penalties and interest, and any local improvement charges, if applicable, shall be paid to the City of Kenora. Six, that a minor variance be approved, reducing the minimum required side yard setback for accessory uses located between the principal building and the navigable waterway from 4.5 meters to zero meters. Seven, that consolidation of the pins is required and a merger agreement be provided. Eight, that prior to endorsement of the deeds, the Secretary Treasurer shall receive a letter from the owner or owner's agent slash solicitor confirming that conditions number one through number seven have been fulfilled, the clearance from the City of Kenora and external agencies as required are to be included. And nine, that all costs associated with surveys, legal fees, and matters related to the application are the responsibility of the developer slash applicant. I note uh, that uh, Sections 5341 and 5343 uh, of the Planning Act apply in regards to conditions not being fulfilled and lapses of consent. And with that, I conclude my report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further to add to that, Kimberly? Nothing further. Um, I did mention earlier that the application for minor variance with respect to the westerly neighboring property is to be heard next week. Or sorry, next month. Okay, uh, given given that, Kevin, should that condition uh, come off of your recommendation, condition number six? No, it, it still has to be heard and approved, and we can't we can't assume that the the minor variance will be approved. Uh, it has to go through the process. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, I'll ask if there's anyone in the public that wishes to speak in favor of this application. Uh, seeing none, I'll ask if there's anyone in the public uh, wishing to oppose this application. Okay, seeing none, I'll refer to the committee members if they have any questions or uh, comments. Mr. McDougall? Nothing for me, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Nothing from me, Mr. Chair. Okay. All right then. Um, then I'll ask if uh, if I can get a uh, a mover. Or first off, okay, go ahead, John. Sure, I'm uh, happy to. Uh, move the application uh, before the committee D10-21-10 application for consent for the lot addition to uh, 792 <clears throat> Coney Island from 794 Coney Island as it's uh, prepared and written by the uh, planner in his report. Thank you, John. Seconder. Okay, all in favor. Okay. Thank you um, to the agent, Mrs. Maya. That is a carried decision here this evening. So you have received provisional approval. Uh, as you had mentioned, we have received uh, application for minor variance, which will be heard in October. Um, and this decision will be mailed out to you or emailed out to you by Thursday. So that will be subject to the 20 day appeal period, which will end on October 13th. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. We'll move to the uh, second item on the agenda, file number D102111. Uh, another application for consent at uh, 19 Sandstone Place. And I believe uh, Mr. Uh, Sayer Down is uh, going to do the presentation. Mr. Chair, actually, the owner, Trevor Pompos, will be making application here this evening. Okay, Trevor, your way. Yes, good evening. Um, my application is uh, for a lot um, uh, to be taken off of 11 sandstone. My wife and I bought a piece of land at 19 sandstone in September. There is a piece of land on uh, just to the southeast of our property 
whereby the, the encroaching property, the neighbors built a um, garage on our, on our property. And we're simply looking to sever that piece off and sell it to our neighbor. Formerly, he has been uh, paying rent to 19, own, the former owner of 19 Sandstone. And we're simply looking to sever it off to make it easier for both himself to sell the property as well as ourselves. Okay, thank you. Kevin, you want to give us your report? Yes, yeah, so uh, we, have, we have our second uh, application tonight for, uh, uh, for consent for a uh, lot addition, uh, which as with, with the previous one will create result in the creation of no new lots, but the realignment of a lot boundary. Uh, the property being severed is currently being developed with a single detached dwelling. And the lot being added to was developed many years ago, also with a single detached dwelling. The owner of the neighboring property, as Mr. Omquist uh, noted, uh, built their driveway fence and garage over the southeast corner of the subject property. Uh, and the owners of the subject property intend to sell their property and wish to settle the encroachment issues by selling the encroached parcel of land uh, to their neighbor. Both properties are connected to municipal sewer and water and have frontage on Sandstone Place. Um, moving forward, uh, there's a couple of images illustrating the property in question in the report, and then moving forward to the provincial policy statement. Uh, the application is generally consistent with the policies of the provincial policy statement, which promotes managing and directing land use to achieve efficient and resilient development and land use patterns. The proposed severance and transfer of the small portion of the property appear to be a reasonable solution to the needs of the applicant, making effective use of land and resources. Regards to the City of Kenora official plan, the land use designations of the subject properties is established area, which provides for residential, commercial, and industrial and institutional uses, such as schools, places of worship, cemeteries, long-term care home, hospitals, and healthcare centers. All adjacent properties are also designated as established area. The official plan is silent on the subject of using consent to sever small portions of property for a realignment of property boundaries, which doesn't create an, uh, result in the creation of a new lot. In regards to the zoning bylaw number 101-2015, both the property being severed and the property being added to are zoned R1, residential first density zone. Develop in the, development in the R1 zone is subject to the regulations of section 4.1 of the zoning bylaw. Lots in the zone must have a minimum lot frontage of 15 meters and a minimum lot area of 450 meters squared when connected to municipal water and sewer. A minimum interior side line setback of 1.5 meters is required for a one-story primary structure. The primary structure, uh, the single detached dwelling with attached garage at 11 Sandstone Place, does not currently meet the interior side yard setback. The proposed lot addition appears to provide sufficient additional property that the primary structure at 11 Sandstone Place will be brought into compliance with the bylaw. Uh, the proposed consent was circulated for interagency interdepartmental and agency circulation. Uh, the only comment we received back was from Synergy North, which noted that they have no concerns provided the existing registered easements detailed on plan 23R-3684 are also transferred with the change in ownership. These easements are required to provide Synergy North with unobstructed access for future operating and maintenance of existing infrastructure. Uh, circulation of the notice was uh, completed in accordance with section 53 of the Planning Act. Um, the public uh, hearing is here tonight and as of the date of the report and since then no public comments have been received in regards to this application. Therefore, it's my evaluation that if approved the proposed severance and lot addition will, will result in the realignment of lot boundaries to correct encroachments that have existed for many years and bring both properties into compliance with the zoning bylaw. This appears to be a reasonable proposal and no concerns through the internal review or by members of the public. The application is supported by the policies of the provincial policy statement and the official plan and appears to be compliant with the zoning bylaw. I note in my report, the legislative framework for consent approval, uh, move forward to my recommendation, uh, which is that application D10-21-11 for consent for lot severance on property located at 19 cents on place and legally described as pin 42172-0621 city of Kenora and the addition of the severed parcel to the property located at 11 Sandstone Place and legally described as pin 42177-0153 City of Kenora be approved and provisional consent be granted subject to the following. One, the original executed transfer slash deed of land form, a duplicate original and one photocopy for city records be provided for each parcel. 
two, a schedule of the transfer slash deed of land form on which is set out the entire legal description of the pins in question and containing the names of the parties indicated on page one of the transfer slash deed of land form be provided for each parcel. Three, that the lands to be transferred for lot addition be surveyed and described on a reference plan and that a draft is provided to the planning department for pre-approval. Four, three original copies and one PDF copy of the reference plan of survey bearing the land registry office registration number and signatures as evidence of deposit therein and illustrating the parts to which the consent approval relates, which will show in general the same area and dimensions of the sketch forming part of the application be provided. Five, that the payment of outstanding taxes, including penalties and interest and any local improvement charges if applicable shall be paid to the city of Kenora. Six, that the existing registered easement detailed in plan 23R-3684 are transferred with the change of ownership. Seven, that the pins are consolidated and a merger agreement is provided to the city of Kenora. Eight, that prior to endorsement of the deeds, the city secretary treasurer shall receive a letter from the owners or owner's agent solicitor confirming that uh, conditions that should, should be numbers one through number seven, uh, not one through six, have been fulfilled. Parents from the city of Kenora and external agencies as required are to be included. And nine, that all costs associated with surveys, legal fees, and matters related to the application are the responsibility of the developer slash applicant. Uh, I note for the record that uh, uh, section 5341 regarding conditions not fulfilled and section 5343 regarding lapse of consent of the Planning Act uh, apply to this application. And with that, I conclude my report. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, with that, with that, uh, I'll ask if there's any other questions or anything to add, Mr. Palmquist. No, nothing for me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Is there anyone in the public that wishes to speak in favor of this application? Seeing or hearing none, is there anyone in the public uh, wishing to express their opposition to this application? Seeing none, I'll open the floor to the committee members. Um, Mr. McDougall? Nothing from me, Mr. Chair. Mr. Barr? Uh, nothing from me, Mr. Chair. Okay, Melissa, could you uh, read us the motion? Sure, I can. Decision that the app, that, that application D102111 for consent lot severance on property located at 19 Sandstone Place and legally described as PIN 42172-0626 City of Kenora and the addition of the seven parcels to the property located at 11 stands of Sandstone Place and legally described as PIN 42177-0153, City of Kenora, be approved and provisional consent be granted subject to the conditions outlined within the planning report and just read by City Planner. Thank you. Could I have a mover and a seconder? I'll move. Mr. Barr, you're going to move? Yes. One. Seconder. Okay, all in favor? Okay, Melissa. Mr. Palmquist, that is a carried vote here this evening. So you have received provisional approval. You will have 12 months of the data decision to complete the conditions as outlined. Uh, you and I can certainly have conversations offline about those conditions. The decision will be mailed to you by Thursday and it will be subject to a 20 day appeal period, which will end on October 13th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next on our uh, list of applications is uh, file number D10-21-10, an application for a plan of subdivision uh, at the unaddressed property at the northeast corner of Sunset Bay Road and Transmission. I believe the agent tonight is uh, Kimberly Maja, again, representing Hook, Seller, and Lundeen. Yes, actually, sorry, um, Ryan Haynes of Kenora Resource Consultants will be providing um, submissions tonight. Okay, that's two in a row I got wrong. <laughs> okay, Mr. Haynes, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't, Melissa, am I able to share my screen here? I just have a, a slide deck to go through with the, the presentation. Sure, I'll ask Adam to give you yep. permission if I you don't will. have it. Oh, perfect. I've just enabled it. Hopefully everyone can see the slide there.
Can everyone see that okay? Yes, we can see it, Ryan. Transmitter road subjects. Okay, sorry, I just wanted to make sure. Um, so this is um, regarding a subdivision application on transmitter roads submitted by Airy Developments. Um, just the, the image right here, and I don't know if you can see my pointer here, so just for some reference, um, down on, on the south side of the image here is, is the Trans-Canada Highway, and this is the junction where it meets with Transmitter Road. Um, on the south side of the highway, you've got Lakeside Baptist Church. Um, next to that is, is that very popular sliding hill, um, and then you've got the Sunset, Sunset Bay Road subdivision here. And then here's the subject property located right on the edge of the settlement boundary. Hopefully that helps provide a little bit of reference. So the um, subject property um, has an OP designation in the official plan. It is in the established area within the settlement area. Um, it's currently zoned residential zone one, R1, and, and the size of the property is 0 0.58 hectares. Uh, it's located um, approximately three kilometers east of Kenora City Hall um, in, in the area I just recently described off of um, Highway 17 um, onto the transmitter road. Uh, as, as was shown there, the lot is uh, currently vacant. Um, about two thirds of its cleared lands and the re remaining one third of, of the subject property is forested. Um, there are existing municipal water and wastewater services along Transmitter Road. This is kind of the, the end of where those services are provided, uh, matching up with the, the settlement boundary. Uh, and there is an existing hydro line that runs along um, a small strip of city owned property between the subject property and Transmitter Road. And here's just some images of um, what, what the property looks like. I'm looking across the, the cleared area on the left there to the west um, towards the neighboring lots. And then on the right, you've got another looking northeast um, along the property for Lawrence's Lake and, and the forested area. So a, a little bit about the surrounding context um, and, and the character of the area. Um, as mentioned, the Trans-Canada Highway is located approximately 200 meters to the west of the subject lands. Um, there is a religious establishment on the south side of Transmitter Road across from the subject property, as mentioned, the, the Lakeside Baptist Church. Um, and, and these other two, two descriptions, in, in some of the um, I guess think comments or um, discussions around this property, there, there came a, a discussion around um, I think what, what a small lot is and, and large lot is. And these are very, um, it can be used as very subjective terms. So, so to try and really um, give some meaning to, to the use of large and small lots, we, we turn to the, the zoning bylaw. Um, and and it's, I think it's pretty apparent once you start, start to look through it, in any time there's a reference for a need for a large lot, whether it's for you know, septic fields or to maintain a low density and rural character, or um, sometimes, you know, for, for waste disposal, that there's various sizes, but by far the most consistent one and, and the smallest one is, is one hectare. Um, I think that, you know, it shows up in rural land use designations, it's two hectares. And I think for waste disposal sites, it's as, as big as 10 hectares. But we really felt that in, in the context of, of you know, the city of Kenora, zoning bylaws, one, one hectare is, is really seems to be what is trying to be captured there as, as kind of the um, difference between a, a small and, and a large lot. And, and so using that um, designation, we characterize the area um, around the, the subject property as being adjacent to a uh, subdivision um, with relatively small waterfront lots. Uh, these are the ones around Sunset Bay and the, these are all less than 0 0.5 hectares. So in, in, in our um, analysis, we feel this isn't even half the size of what would be considered a, a large lot. And uh, interestingly enough, um, the properties to the east of the subject lines around Transmitter Road are also characterized by waterfront and backlots. But these are typically, most of these are undersized legal non-conforming properties. Uh, 
that typically do not meet the minimum lot area requirements of one hectare as identified in, in the zoning bylaw. Um, I think when we looked at it, I think there's close to 30 lots between uh, the settlement boundary and Old Road, and I think five of them actually met this, this test of actually uh, being a large lot and also being um, meeting the, the, the test of being um, meeting the minimum size for um, the rural residential land use designation. So I think it was characterized typically by, by smaller lots, um, both waterfront and, and back access lots um, along the, the transmitter road. And I think as uh, was mentioned, I think that the ink's still drying on, on this plan of subdivision, but um, this just shows kind of what, what's being proposed here. Um, lot, lot one is, is retained, and this is the lone waterfront lot. So there are no new waterfront lots being retained here. There's are being created. There's, they're started with one waterfront lot and there's still just one waterfront lot. Um, there's lots two, three, four, and five, um, which um, are the newly created lots. Um, you, you can see uh, there's a easement um, along the south side of both lot three and lot four, that that is the design there is to create um, one access. So there'll be one entrance for lots two, three, four, and five, as you'll see in some of the upcoming drawings. And then there's another easement running east west there for water and sewer. So the, the proposal, as mentioned, is, is to create four new lots located off Transmitter Road. Um, this Development does not require any changes to the official plan designation, uh, remains as established area. Um, in order to, um, the interest here is, is in to create uh, semi-detached homes um, that will be on the boundaries of lot two and three, as well as on the boundary of lot four and five. Um, and in order to create you know, the ability to put semi-detached homes in here, and obviously the, the reasoning for this is to to um, save some costs and um, be able to provide some, some more affordable housing for the area. I think I mean, these um, are still like, higher end properties from the drawings I've seen, but there's certainly some cost savings anytime you go with a semi-detached. So I think it'll, it'll help um, as we'll get into in a bit with some of the housing needs in, in the community. Um, and with the rezoning, the lot dimensions meet or in most cases exceed the minimum requirements for residential zone two, um, which, which actually are, are the same as, as zone one. Um, and we'll get into a little bit about privacy, but they'll also maintain privacy for existing and future residents by keeping a portion of the tree stand at the north end of the property and also meeting or exceeding all of the side yard and front yard, rear yard requirements. Again, that the proposal is to propose semi-detached dwellings, and on the retained piece um, will be a constructed a single detached dwelling. Um, and it's felt that these um, this development will contribute to providing a range and mix of housing available for the city. So here's, and this just uh, shows for each of the lots um, what the city requirement is um, for the zoning, um, both for lot area frontage, front yard, interior side yard, exterior side yard, rear yard, and lot coverage. And you can see right across the board, they're either met or exceeded for, for the requirements. And, and I think another term that's been come up in some of the discussions around this property is, is privacy. And it's, it's important to, I think, note that um, in general, planning policy is, is pretty silent on privacy. In fact, it is that the word does not show up in, in the provincial policy statement once. Um, in the city of Kenora um, bylaws, it shows up once and it's only when it describes the um, yards and, and the yard setbacks. So I think when you're looking at privacy, the, the expression of privacy in, in planning is the side yard requirements and, and the distances. And, and I think in, in this case, they are met or exceeded um, with, with all, all of these lots. Um, for the, the proposed subdivision. Um, as mentioned, the severed lots will have a shared entrance from Transmitter Road. Um, the retained lot will have a separate entrance also from Transmitter Road. 
uh, in terms of density. Uh, the city defines low density residential being less than 16 units per hectare. Um, this is about half that, so obviously still a very low dense, low, low density development, uh, 8.6 units per hectare, almost half of what is considered um, low. Uh, and it's, it results in an increase in more efficient use of lands in the city and also meets the goals of the provincial policy statement and city of Kenora's official plan, which uh, encourage development on vacant lands that make use of existing municipal, municipal service. And here's the provincial policy statement, uh, emphasizes the importance of growth within existing settlement areas. Um, the development should have a compact form, mix of uses and densities that allow the efficient use of land infrastructure and public service facilities. Uh, it also says it should accommodate a range of housing options. And the development should be transit supportive and promote active transportation. And um, this um, proposed development is both um, very close to public transportation. Um, and so just a short walk to catch city buses if, if people need to. And it is also a very short distance for people who want to walk or bike to amenities, also encouraging active transportation, an important part of um, in any climate change. This is, is also um, encouraged, and as mentioned, the, the development is located, um, you know, biking or walking distance from downtown Kenora, the rec center, and many other services and amenities, thereby promoting active transportation. Um, one of the um, features, or I guess, planning um, issues related to this property is if there was an adjacent property. Um, that did have an Ontario Municipal Board ruling associated with it uh, approximately 20 years ago. Um, I think it's just important um, just, just to keep, keep in mind here that the OMB rules based on the planning context of, of the day and the provincial policy statement, the, you know, the governing provincial document that would um, have a lot huge influence, I think, in, in rulings that the OMB would make has gone through numerous changes. Um, it's gone through three significant iterations in 2005, 2014, and 2020. Um, I think 2005, um, very importantly, it, it um, really started to focus on the concept of um, intensification, um, infilling, and also making use of existing municipal services and, and in increasing development in areas where it did not put additional stress on municipal services to increase efficiencies. And, and these changes that were brought about in 2005 have only been strengthened in, in subsequent iterations of, of the provincial policy statement. So that the planning context um, has, has really changed a lot in the last 20 years for um, any um, planning decisions for development such as this. Um, and even with that, even, even if, um, say, there had been a ruling on a neighboring property, say, even in the last few months by the Ontario Lands Tribunal, uh, important to keep in mind that um, in Ontario, the uh, planning appeals boards do not operate with the doctrine of precedent. So hearings are not bound by previous decisions. So each hearing chair can make their ruling based on, on the, the um, matters before them and, and not constrained by any previous ruling. So I think with with that, I just, um, just I guess in, in my opinion, I, I think that the any use of the OMB to, to influence um, the, the committee's decision on this, I think it just take, take this, this into consideration that um, the, the past uh, rulings, especially when, when they're decades old, I, I, I don't think um, have a lot of bearing, especially given that even um, with the, the doctrine of precedent that um, it, it shouldn't influence decisions on, on current um, planning applications. And just wanted to talk a, a little bit about um, the public interest. And um, I've, I've just, um, as I think people on, on the committee may know, um, I back school a few years ago and have been gradually working towards my 
RPP designation. And I actually took the final uh, professional exam yesterday. So I spent lots of time preparing for that and studying and thinking about the, the public interest. And one of the things um, I thought about that, that I think is, is um, maybe a shortcoming of, of this process is, is that the committee ne never gets to hear from, you know, whether it's individuals or families that may be able to take advantage of these new housing opportunities that, that, that get created. Um, especially given, you know, in the city of Kenora, we're all very well aware of, of the housing shortage here. And while I'm, I'm certainly not going to be able to speak on behalf of any, any future owners, I think there is uh, information we, we can turn to to really look look at the need um, for um, housing development such as this. Um, in 2018, the State of Housing Report for the city of Kenora um, identified a lack of diversified housing options in Kenora, which... Um, causing people to spend disproportionately more on, on their housing costs. Um, the report concluded that the city of Kenora should focus on developing vacant land within the city's established, established area as the first step towards closing Kenora's housing gap. And when we looked into data um, available from the CMHC, um, from data right up to the end of June, 2021 on um, what's happening in, in construction in, in Kenora, you, you can see that there's a real singular focus on single detached dwellings. You can see that across Canada, less than a third of completed construction projects in the last five years have been single detached. Uh, in Ontario, it's just over a third that have been single detached in the last five years. And in Kenora, it's over 80%, over four out of every five, um, housing opportunities are being built as single detached. So I think when you look at those other areas, whether it's apartment, row housing, semi-detached, these are the areas where, as, as shown in, in this chart here, I think long way to go towards um, promoting and encouraging those, those types of development to really start to address uh, affordability and providing a, a mixed range of, of housing um, or to, to meet, meet the needs and also address uh, what's in the provincial policy statement and the um, city of Kenora official plan. So just in, in, in summary here, uh, the, the, the property is uh, currently vacant and underutilized. Uh, the proposal complies with the uh, provincial policy city of Kenora official plan. Um, a zoning bylaw amendment is proposed to rezone the subject property from R1 to R2, and, and that is to allow for uh, the semi-detached homes and like, like we just mentioned that previous slide and, and help kind of um, move some of that uh, other colors in, into the red there and getting away from a, a single detached focus on, on housing developments. Uh, the proposed new lots are in keeping with the surrounding land uses as, as demonstrated. Uh, the proposal is transit supportive and can promote active transportation due to proximity to local services, business and amenities. Um, there's existing municipal and water sewage, sewage available, so that um, makes efficient use of municipal resources. And the proposal would aid the city in, in diversifying its housing stock, which is desperately needed as, as identified in, in uh, 2018. Thank you very much for your time. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Haynes. And uh, Mr. Sumner, will you uh, proceed with your report? Yep, I certainly can do so. Uh, so um, uh, there will be a little bit of rehashing here. Uh, uh, Brian did co uh, cover things quite thoroughly. Uh, so the application is to has been received to divide the ownership of the subject property into five separate proposed lots. That'd be four new lots plus one residual to enable development of five dwelling units on the property. Uh, the applicants are uh, the proposed, sorry, as the proposed development will require the extension of municipal sewer and water services, four lots exceed the number of lots, uh, which is three that may be granted under an application for consent as directed by policy 8.11.3 consents in the city of Kenora official plan, which is why we have an application for uh, subdivision. If approved, the subdivision will allow for each property to be developed with a separate residence and no new waterfront lots are being created. If the associated zoning amendment from R1 to R2 is also approved for the four smaller lots, those lots may be developed with semi-detached units as envisioned in the site plan uh, submitted by the applicant and included in my report. 
so the subject property, um, as we've heard, is approximately 5,820 square meters and located on the south shore of Lawrence and Lake and fronting on Sunset Bay Road. A small strip of city-owned property separates the property from Transmitter Road. Uh, the property remains undeveloped despite having been created as a lot more than 20 years ago and being zoned for residential development. Approximately two thirds of the property has been cleared with the stand of trees remaining on the northern third. The high point of the lot is located near the corner of Sunset Bay Road and Transmitter Road with a steady slope from there to the shoreline reserve along the lakeshore. The area of Lawrence and Lake in front of the property appears to be marsh but has not been formally identified as part of the Lawrence and Lake uh, slash Creek wetland complex which is a provincially significant wetland uh, located elsewhere on Lawrence and Lake. Neighboring properties on Sunset Bay Road range in size from approximately 2,200 to 3,850 square meters in area and have been developed with single detached homes. Uh, church and unserviced rural residential lots are located on the opposite side of Transmitter Road. I include a panoramic site uh, image of the site taken from the uh, Sunset Bay uh, uh, edge of the property in my report. Uh, in regards to uh, consistency with legislative policy and directives, uh, first of all, the provincial policy statement, uh, the subdivision application is consistent with the policies of the PPS, including policy 1.1.3.1, which states that settlement areas shall be the focus of growth and development. Policy 1.1.3.2 states that land use patterns within settlement areas shall be based on densities and a mix of land uses, which efficiently use land and resources and are appropriate for and efficiently use the infrastructure and public service facilities which are planned or available and avoid the needs for their unjustified and or uneconomical expansion amongst other criteria. This policy further states that land use patterns within settlement areas shall also be based on a range of land uses and opportunities for intensification and redevelopment in accordance with the criteria of policy 1.1.3.3 where this can be accommodated. Policy 1.1.3.3 states that policy authorities shall identify appropriate locations and promote opportunities for transit supported development, accommodating a significant supply and range of housing options through intensification and redevelopment where this can be accommodated, taking into account existing building stock or areas and the availability of suitable existing or planned infrastructure and public service facilities required to accommodate projected needs. Policy 1.1.3.6 states that new development taking place in designated growth areas, such as areas designated and available for residential development in Kenora's settlement area, should occur adjacent to the existing built up area and should have a compact form, mix of uses and densities that allow for the efficient use of land infrastructure and public service facilities. And finally, and then policy 1.4.3 states that planning authorities shall provide for an appropriate range and mix of housing options and densities to meet projected market-based and affordable housing needs of current and future residents of the regional market by, one, first of all, permitting and facilitating all housing options required to meet the social, health, economic, and well-being requirements of current and future residents, including special needs requirements and needs arising from demographic changes and employment opportunities and all types of residential intensification, including additional residential units and redevelopment in accordance with policy 1.1.3.3. Also through directing the development of new housing towards locations where appropriate levels of infrastructure and public service facilities are or will be available to support current and projected needs. And finally, promoting densities for new housing which efficiently use land resources, infrastructure and public service facilities and support the use of active transportation and transit in areas where it exists or is to be developed. In, regard, in regards to the City of Toronto official plan, uh, land use designation of the property is established area, which provides for residential, commercial, industrial, and institutional uses, such as schools, places of worship, cemeteries, long-term care homes, hospitals, and health centers. All of the neighboring properties fronting on Sunset Bay Road are also designated as established area, as is the property immediately across Transmitter Road. Neighboring properties to the east of the subject property are designated as rural area and are outside of the city's designated settlement area. A large property to the, should be southwest, uh, fronting on Highway 17A East is designated as commercial development area. Policy 4.1.2C of the official plan states that residential development shall be encouraged in the established area through plans of subdivision, condominium and consent as infilling or redevelopment of existing uses on full municipal services. 
Medium density residential use, Selby supported provided the development is keeping with the character of the area. The official plan policy 6.1H states in part that there shall be no new development on Lawrence and Lake without the availability of municipal sewer and water services. And it is important to notice though, that in this case, there is uh, municipal sewer and water available. In terms of the City of Kenora zoning bylaw, number 101-2015, the property is zoned R1, residential first density. This zone allows for the development of single detached housing and other compatible uses serviced by municipal water and sewer or with municipal water only. All of the lots fronting on Sunset Bay Road are zoned R1. Properties immediately across Transmitter Road are zoned as I, institutional zone, and RR, rural residential zone, while other properties to the east and southwest are zoned RU, rural zone. The R1 zone does not permit the development of semi-detached housing that the applicant is proposing for the four Western lots in the proposed uh, subdivision and therefore a uh, zoning amendment is required. The proposed lot sizes and frontages all exceed the minimum required lot size of 450 square meters and the minimum frontage of 15 meters required for lots in the R1 zone. And I've included a summary table, which uh, is similar to the one that was already described by uh, Mr. Haynes. If the associated zoning amendment were approved, the proposed lots would also comply with the R2 regulations for lot size and frontage, which are the same as the R1 requirement. The proposed subdivision was uh, circulated interdepartmentally and for agency comments. And uh, I'll summarize the comments that we received. Uh, uh, Kenora Engineering uh, Department noticed that servicing will be unique as it has to come off the flank instead of the frontage with each dwelling requiring its own service to the city mains. Uh, Kenora Roads noted that groundwater drainage will need to be established in the ditch line along Transmitter Road, which would flow north towards Lawrence and Lake. Entrance permits required prior to development and hydro lines seem quite low on the property adjacent to Transmitter Road. Kenora Water and Wastewater noted the proposed water and wastewater servicing requires easements so that each house is serviced individually and the owner is responsible from the property line to their respective residences for both services. The sewers are only accessible on Sunset Bay Road and the preferred water main connection is also there. Suggest access by municipally owned laneway, which would contain the water and sewer, sewage supply and collection mains that are a minimum of 150 meters, millimeters in diameter. And the sizing is dependent on the engineering department's preferred design standards. Bell Canada noted no concerns, but advised the owner to contact Bell Canada during detailed design to confirm the provision of communication and telecommunication infrastructure needed to service the development. Uh, circulation of the notice of, uh, of complete application and hearing uh, was completed in accordance with section 51, 19.4 of the Planning Act. Uh, notice was also provided by way of email and uh, email and mail circulation to the persons and public bodies as prescribed within on Ontario Regulation 544-06. And we're here tonight at the virtual public hearing. As of the date of the report, uh, seven letters had been received, and I believe there, there's a couple were received after that, from members of the public expressing opposition to the proposed zoning amendment. Uh, most letters of opposition make reference to the municipal board order, which overturned the previous consent application on the neighboring property. Previous concerns mentioned in the letters include, uh, or specific concerns mentioned in the letters include, no new dwellings would overlook, or sorry, the new dwellings would overlook neighboring lots resulting in loss of privacy. That the new lots would be out of character with neighboring properties due to a smaller size, lack of frontage on or orientation towards the lake. Uh, safety concerns regarding driveways on the transmitter road, uh, increasing traffic on transmitter road, site plan submitted by the developer inaccurately is, uh, is preliminary and identifies two dwellings on an adjacent property. Uh, potential impact on Lawrence and Lake, the impact of development on neighboring property values, uh, crime and nuisance if low-income families live in the proposed dwellings, and home prices may be less than the million dollar homes elsewhere on Lawrence and Lake. Several of the letters in opposition make reference to a previous application for consent that was made in 1999 to sever the property at 2 Sunset Bay Road, located west of this property, into two parcels. That application was approved by the Kenora Kuwait and Planning Board. Uh, the decision of the Planning Board was appealed to the Municipal Board by a number of residents who lived in the immediate area. 
The board overturned the consent, noting the proposed new lot was out of character with surrounding lots and development on the high point of the property would result in loss of privacy for the neighbors. The board also found at that time there was sufficient 10 year supply of service vacant lots in the city of Kenora, so that there was uh, no need to justify an additional lot. And uh, I will note, as Mr. Haynes noted earlier, that uh, 22 years of time uh, uh, results in uh, a new set of policies and changing circumstances uh, uh, that may not, uh, and uh, circumstances are not the same here now today as they were uh, back in 1999. Uh, in return, in regards to the legislative framework for the draft plan of subdivision approval, I note here the, the framework upon under which uh, 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 subdivision approvals are to be considered. And it has been on the basis of that framework that I, uh, I've uh, structured my evaluation under section 10. And so I'll proceed to that. Uh, the, the, the lettering and under section 10 uh, refers to the section, uh, to the corresponding sections under section nine uh, that are being evaluated. So the proposed site plan, in my opinion, meets the planning criteria for approval as uh, listed in, it should be section nine. Uh, A, the site plan is consistent with the policy directions of the provincial policy statement with, with regards to promoting residential intensification and more efficient use of municipal services. As an extra cautionary step during the, due to the proximity of Lawrence and Lake and the adjacent marshland area, the planning department contact the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks to make them aware of the pending application when it was first proposed to city staff in July. Uh, our ministry contact passed that information onto their surface water unit uh, who did not respond despite repeated requests. B, the proposed site plan will allow for the development of a property that has remained vacant for more than 20 years, despite being appro appropriately zoned for residential development. The city of Kenora has recognized our need to develop more housing in the city. And so the proposed development of five dwelling units meets a current urgent need as, and is in the broader public interest. C, the proposed site plan conforms to the policies of the city of Kenora official plan, specifically policy 4.1.2C, which encourages infill residential development in the established area and policy 6.1H, which allows development on Lawrence and Lake when serviced with municipal sewer and water. The proposed lots are of a similar shape and size to other residential lots in areas of the city designated as established area, though smaller than neighboring lots that were developed when the area did not have access to municipal sewer system service. D, the site plan is suitable for the purpose of the land, which is gently sloping and has long been zoned for such development. Municipal sewer and water systems are readily available. E, the proposed lots all have access to transmitter road across city property. Transmitter road is designated collector road that already provides access to a large number of residential properties on the south side of Lawrence and Lake and further east. The number of new driveways onto transmitter road will be reduced by having two driveways providing uh, shared access for the four smaller lots. And I will note here, we were contacted by a neighboring resident uh, on Friday with regards to the ownership of transmitter road. Uh, large sections oh, of Transmitter start? Road are technically on private property, uh, though it is a, an established um, a municipal road that has uh, been uh, built and maintained by the City of Kenora. Uh, so uh, the, while there is an ownership there that uh, should be clean, uh, cleared up at some future date, uh, that is a public road that, uh, that these properties can access. Under section and F, the dimensions and shapes of the proposed lots comply with the regulations of both the existing R1 zone and the proposed R2 zone. Municipal sewer and water systems are readily available. I can the large this. lots on Sunset Bay Road were logical at the time they were developed in the early 1980s when no municipal sewage system was available and homes on... Sorry, I think somebody hasn't got their mic on, their mute on. Um, Sorry, the, the large lots on Sunset Bay Road were logical at the time they were developed in the early 1980s when no municipal sewage systems was available and homes on Sunset Bay Road had to have on-site private septic systems. The city of Kenora still requires that R1 lots without municipal sewer connect, connections be a minimum of 1200 meters squared or almost three times the size of fully serviced lots. Since the area is now serviced with municipal sewer, large lots are no longer required. G, the proposed residences will be required to connect to municipal sewer and water as required under policy 6.1H of the official plan and the regulations of the zoning bylaw for both R1 and R2 zone properties. H, with respect to natural resources, there are no known natural heritage features or areas of, on the proposed subdivision. 
I, municipal sewer and water connections are available at Sunset Bay Road. The applicant will be responsible for extending those services to the dwellings on the individual lots and setting in place easements for lines that cross intervening properties in the subdivision. Grinder pumps will be required for any dwelling that is downhill from the sewer, sewer main. J, at the time of this report, the school boards have not identified the need for a school site on the subject lands. K, no dedication of land is required for public purposes. L, the proposed lots will be available, able to connect to the existing electrical lines which run along Transmitter Road. And M, the proposed development with one dwelling unit per lot is exempted from site plan control. Therefore, it's my recommendation that the creation of four new lots be approved as proposed in the site plan. It is my opinion that the proposed site plan meets the criteria as set out in section 5124 of the Planning Act and that draft approval may be given by the Planning Advisory Committee. This draft approval applies to the site plan circulated as file number D10-21-12 for the subject property located at the northeastern corner of the intersection of Transmitter Road and Sunset Bay Road being pin number 42168-0592. And it is further recommended that approval be subject to the following conditions as well as any others deemed necessary by the city of Kenora. Those conditions being that one, that this Draft approval applies to the plan of subdivision file number D10-21-12, unaddressed property at the corner of Sunset Bay Road and Transmitter Road, Kenora, Ontario. Two, prior to final approval being granted, the City of Kenora shall confirm that the final plan for that phase is in compliance with the zoning bylaw in effect. Three, that approvals are received from the City for the provision of any future entrance permits, culverts and materials as required to develop driveway access where a new entrance is required an easement agreement or private road agreement registered on a title with regards to indemnification, maintenance, upkeep, garbage collection, and school bus pickup. Four, prior to final approval being granted, the City of Kenora shall provide a copy of the, be provided a copy of the final plan in a digital format. Five, easements shall be registered on the individual property titles regarding shared driveway access for the semi-detached dwellings, and as may be required for connections to municipal sewer and or water systems, drainage or other purposes in favor of the property owner requiring access to that portion of that property. Six, that a drainage plan be submitted for groundwater drainage on the proposed lots and the municipal ditch along Transmitter Road. Seven, that all costs associated with extension of services, development of private driveways, surveys, legal fees and matters related to the application are the responsibility of the owner. Eight, that prior to final approval, a digital file of the plan to be registered will be provided to the City of Kenora Planning Department in PDF format. Nine, the three original copies, not photocopies of the plan of survey bearing the land registry office registration number and signatures as evidence of deposit therein be provided that illustrate the lots, exclusive use common areas, the common elements, the retained land, and any other items to which the approval relates. It must show in general the same area and dimensions as the site plan forming part of this application. 10, the final plan for registration must be in a registrable form together with all necessary instruments or plans describing an interest in the land. 11, that the payment of any outstanding taxes, including penalties and interest, and any local improvement charges if applicable, shall be paid to the City of Kenora. 12, that the owner agrees that should any conflict arise with existing Bell Canada facilities, where a current and valid easement exists within the subject area, the owner shall be responsible for the relocation of any such facilities or easements at their own cost. And 13, that prior to final approval, the City of Kenora shall receive a letter from the owner or owner's agent or solicitor uh, confirming that conditions 1 through 11 have been fulfilled. Clearance letters from the City of Kenora and external agencies are to be included. And uh, I have notes there that uh, prior to any grading or any construction on the site, the developer may be requested to provide a drainage plan to identify the capacity of the existing natural swells under proposed ditches and to demonstrate that the drainage for all roads and lots be as close to the property lines as possible. Reference will made to a overall drainage plan runoff flow calculation. And two, the prior to development of the shoreline public reserve, appropriate approvals must be obtained from the city of Kenora and or the Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry. And I note that uh, uh, sections 32, 33 of the, uh, uh, under sub, uh, of, sorry, uh, of the Planning Act uh, reply in regards to lapse of approval and extension of the approval. That concludes my report. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Mr. Haynes, do you have anything to uh, comment or add on that report? No, no, nothing further. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Kimberly, do you have anything to add? Nothing for me, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, we'll move to uh, the public for, for their comments in favor and opposition. And uh, may I respectfully ask that the public uh, limit their uh, presentations to uh, five minutes, please. So with that, um, is there anyone in the public that would like to speak in favor of this application? Okay, seeing none. Is there anyone in the public wishing to speak in opposition to this application? Okay, I'll uh, I'll take you uh, one at a time, starting with uh, Pat Suchuk. Thank you for letting me make some disjointed comments this evening. Uh, this is sort of out of my league. Um, so, however, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, Pat. Could uh, you state your name and your address pri prior to uh, your presentation? I'm Pat Suchuk. I live at 10 Sunset Bay. I've lived there for 38 years. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for letting me make some disjointed comments this evening. This is kind of out of my league, but I'd like to... Uh, make a few more comments than what we did in our, our letter of the 17th. I am sure you have all read the liter literature which we have submitted opposing uh, the proposed changes to this one occupied lot that's left in our subdivision of six. Um, I would hope that maybe some of you took the time and the committee to drive over to see the area in question firsthand as sometimes photos are and written comments can be deceiving or distorted. We lived at the top of Minto Avenue, in the, Minto Avenue in the 70s. It was a great place to live. It was a fine subdivision at that time. There were single family homes and they were all basically the same. It was a, it, it, at that time, it made Kenora proud. A few years later, we built a cottage on Storm Bay. When this property on Lawrence's Lake came up for sale, we sold the house, the cottage, and for 38 years, Sunset Bay has been both our home and our cottage. 20 years ago, a, a lot owner asked to have his uh, lot divided into two lots. The city approved it, but it was appealed and the decision was overturned by the, at then called the OMB board. The reasons that I remember that the board, this OMB board gave from notable people at, at the time was that the, the, the splitting of the thing of uh, the lot would be out of character with the rest of the area. The lot would be the wrong shape. All of our lots were waterfront properties and it would set a precedent for lot number six, which we are speaking about today. Today, however, 20 years later, I know I've heard all these changes of the different bylaws or whatever you call them, zonings, but we are still back with the same issue. Someone has applied to create a subdivision out of one unoccupied lot in our little subdivision of six. Um, I tried desperately, I'm not a planner, I tried desperately to, miss, to read Mr. Sumner's report um, from the city. As a lay person, I have no access to a planning act in, within two weeks, nor have I been given time to read it. All the numbers and the quotations um, that have been quoted, I guess I have to accept the measurements and all of that. All the numbers that have been quoted do not really justify making these changes on only one lot. I would think a lot of them apply to redevelopments and uh, new, new land areas that want to be developed. But we're talking about one lot that has been for sale for 40 years. It, it's not a new lot and it's not a 20 year lot. Um, one of the things that I think is conformity and a duplex with common walls does not conform to the houses that we have in our little subdivision at this time. Our houses are single. We have lots of space between the residences. Um, our lots are all waterfront. Uh, they, they're not little rectangles. Um, it, it, that's just two examples that I think just will not conform to our little area, which has been established for 
38 years or 40 years. This kind of reminds me, all I can put it in words is, it kind of reminds me of trying to put a square peg into a round hole. And I know Kenora needs housing, but there's lots of undeveloped land. We still have tons of properties, uh, Lappinier's properties. The property across the road from us is for sale. I know it's uh, zoned commercial, but with the writing of a pen, you could turn it into residential. As a committee appointed by the city, I consider you my voice. I'm the citizen and the taxpayer in this matter. I am assuming that you are an independent, knowledgeable thinker, thinkers when it comes to these matters concerning planning changes. Therefore, I am counting on you, my voice, to do your due diligence in making a decision on this extremely important matter by giving credible, justifiable reasons for whatever decision you decide. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Anyone else? I would like to speak. Uh, Can Mr. you hear me? Pichelo? Mr. Pacalo, go ahead. There you go. Okay. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Robert Pacalo. I live at 11 Sunset Bay Road in Kenora. And uh, I'm not going to go through and duplicate a lot of the things that Pat just finished saying. So uh, I'll try and keep my comments short. Uh, as mentioned at the start of the meeting, there was a survey that just came out today. <coughs> Pardon me. September the 21st. And on this survey, I don't see an easement anywhere for sewer and water going to lot one of the proposed development. And I'd like yeah. to know, it's lot one. And I'd like to know what the plan is for city services to this lot. Next thing is that uh, we strongly disagree with the road report that was made in Mr. Sumner's uh, report. It indicates that there is no problem with two or three driveways. Now, they can't seem to decide whether there's two or three. It's referenced as two in one place and three in another. Anyway, <clears throat> if we've got two or three driveways coming on to transmit a road in this area, I would like to invite each member of the planning board to take a ride along transmitter road, approaching this area from both directions at approximately 50 kilometers an hour, which is probably slow for a lot of the traffic that is on this road and see how comfortable you'd be with two more driveways entering transmitter road along this hill with a curve at the bottom and then try and imagine walking along that piece of road. We're also concerned about the lack of response from the Ministry of Natural Resources regarding the ditching and runoff directed into already uh, an already stressed Lawrence's Lake. Uh, it was mentioned in the report from KRC that a stand of trees would create a visual buffer between the proposed development and the neighboring properties. Now, if you go and stand on the proposed lots four and five, you'll see that there are very few, if any, trees blocking the view of these lots into four of the original properties. It's been suggested also that the original properties were made as large as they are because septic fields were necessary at the time that they were created. That may have been part of the reason, but more importantly, we either bought and built or moved here because we valued the space, privacy, and the cottage-like atmosphere in this area. Now you mentioned in section 10D, the application for plan of subdivision D 10 12 that the property has long been zoned for such development. In fact, as far as I know, it's currently zoned R1, which is, does not allow for such development. In section eight, on um, page eight of the application for the zoning bylaw amendment D 14 
It states that the intention is to maintain the same density, that is one dwelling per lot, as would be accomplished under the current R1 zoning. Now, one dwelling for 574 to 977 square meters, which are the lot sizes in the proposed development, is not the same density in my mind as one dwelling for 2,217 to 3,856 square meters, which are the lot sizes in the existing neighborhood. And therefore, I would suggest that these new lots are out of character uh, in the area. Now, as Mr. Ames and uh, Mr. Sumner both mentioned, previous uh, and Pat too, for that matter, uh, a previous application to divide the property into two lots, never mind five, was denied by the OMB in 2000. The decision stated at that time, and I quote, it was bad planning. It was then, and it still is now. The decision went on to say that, and I quote again, planning should not be done in a vacuum. Surrounding land use and compatibility are legitimate planning concerns. This area has been designated R1 for about 40 years. I don't see why this zoning should be changed just to accommodate uh, a developer like uh, when Pete, when, like, when Pat says there are many other areas that are available and suitable for development. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kevin, did you want to comment on the uh, couple of questions uh, Mr. McHale had with respect to the easement and the number of driveways? Yes, yeah, so, so there are, I, I, I think I referred to the two driveways for the two duplexes. There is a third driveway for the single family dwelling. So that may have been why, uh, I believe why it was referenced as two driveways for the duplexes and, and three driveways in total elsewhere. Um, and uh, sorry, what was the, the other question? The, the easement. Oh, yeah. So it, it certainly it is a condition that uh, all easements be registered on the property. Uh, and some of that will depend on all the servicing that needs to be run for all five lots. Uh, the, certainly the the applicant will need to figure out uh, where all that uh, the municipal or all the sewer and water connections are running on the property and assign such easements as required and so that is our expectations that we'll we'll see final easements that address all issues on the property as a condition of the subdivision and i, I believe that in the draft plan that was submitted uh, i don't think all or they, they, there wasn't easements noted on there for the for the easternmost property, but they will need to sort that out before they register the final plan. Thanks, Kevin. Is there anyone else who'd like to uh, speak in opposition? Tracy, go ahead. Yes, please, thank you. Um, I have a few things that I've come across um, in listening to your comments. Um, the planning committee was looking at lots um, in regards to size and what defined large or small. And reviewing the map that the city provides for zoning, it's quite clear that the lots on the Sunset Bay Road subdivision, as it was made, of course, initially were because of, as stated, sewer and water, but now are on ser services. There are no other lots of that size, and if there are, they're few and far between within the city. Uh, therefore, making our area um, an original and unique space, which needs to be considered because, of course, our families have all been there for the entire time of the subdivision. Uh, we were actually forced onto the water system because of the water quality of Lawrence and Lake. Uh, the city pushed through and ended at our subdivision. If you go any further down the transmitter road, they are all listed as RR and have required space for septic fields. Therefore, I do not feel they should be um, considered part of the 
proposed um, uh, uh, reflection of lot sizes. Um, so this particular subdivision that is happening is completely out of character. Secondly, when I was reading through provincial legislation on the Ministry of Transportation sites for sight lines for driveways, none of the driveways from what I can see will comply with that. Uh, the site, because it's on a hill, there are corners. Um, there are also other traffic coming from the church, uh, creates a very um, hazardous situation for everyone using the road and the people having the driveways. Uh, thirdly, I'd like to say that, um, you know, we as a group, as Mr. Pacalo has said, um, and Pat has said, Mrs. Suchak, my father and that group bought these properties as residents with the idea that they would be estate settings. There are no estate settings like subdivision Sunset Bay in Kenora. Therefore, it is unique to itself. And um, regardless of how the, which I have read both the provincial and the city um, plan for, for developing housing within the area, um, I really don't feel that our area needs to be one of those places. It's not our fault that the owner of the property had it well priced above its indicated value. None of us paid that lot value and um, it was lay, it lay empty all of those years because the people were being ridiculous with their price. If you were to tell me that you were going to subdivide this lot into two, I would oppose it because our family were not allowed to do that and we were going to do it to build a house for um, our family to live together in one area. Uh, so um, I think this opens up a whole a whole non-issue of fact that this property should not be subdivided in this way. If you said it was going to be subdivided in two, I might say, okay, I get it. But into five does not match the estate value of our area. And as Kenora residents, as people who have grown in the community, we wish to maintain our area as Kenoraites. This is a subdivision, uh, uh, as, um, a, uh, a developer from Toronto who is taking advantage of the new mandates provided by the, provi uh, the province and municipalities um, and has come in and is working throughout the city looking to develop areas that are potential growth areas. Uh, this is one piece of land. There are several others that can be developed for this kind of structure that is similar, uh, that will allow for more duplexes, that will be of similar. I don't care if they're high or low end townhouses, it doesn't matter to me. But this is an estate subdivision as previously planned out by the city itself. And now the city's going contrary to what it what it planned. I cannot find another piece of property on this map that shows me the same size as ours. And I'm just asking for the city planning department to maintain what was originally put forward. And that is the lot sizes that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Sir, go ahead. I don't have your name and address. Uh, my name is Kenny. I'm on 6 Sunset Bay Road. Um, I'm not going to even... The people before me have definitely stated stated very many, many reasons why this subdivision should not be even considered at all. Uh, but they go around talk use people talk about how accessible this is for walking accessing highway 17 we're talking highway 17 people that is a highway the speed limit reduces to 50 on that corner we cannot see anything coming around that corner when we do walk and because of the hazardous situation there i myself and i know my neighbors we drive to walmart and then do our walking from there we do not ever, ever go walking on that highway because it's absolutely dangerous. Number two, from, I'm gonna say when the snow starts flying, 
that road is plowed and the government looks after it really well, or maybe the city of Kenora looks after it really well, but the sidewalks are no longer accessible all the way through till the end of May. So where do you, where do you get this great walking from? I have no idea. Use people have never, I don't even know if the planner has ever been there. He said he was going to be when I talked to him, he said he was going to come over before this meeting and have a look. But I don't know if he walked down to the highway and had a look around the corner because you cannot see. So yeah, num number two or three or four, I look at this proposed, uh, you, are you gonna tell me they're gonna build a road in front of all these houses and that's part of their lot size? They're putting a one road across all four houses and that's considered part of the lot size? I don't know where you got two roads because the plan I received from the city only has one road accessing these four lots and then we have a road in, cross in front of all those four properties. So I don't know how you consider a road as part of a, but yeah, the sub, this new subdivision is totally, totally it's wrong. wrong for this area. We all purchased, and I'm going to, I'm with Pat Wider. We lived on Guernsey Street back in the seventies. And when they built all those townhouses there, I have people coming, stealing stuff out of my backyard and so we were forced to leave there because of the situation that and we're going to have the same thing right here you're talking about building low cost housing i don't know how low cost it can be when housing is 200 dollars a square foot so we're talking 350 400 thousand dollar houses here i think the city needs to have a definitely find there's there's lots of places somebody submitted a letter with very many 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 lots available for such a subdivision and i want my taxes lowered anyways i appreciate your ear and yeah totally thank disagree. you thank you mr ames uh anyone else uh teresa go ahead hey oh Sorry, Mr. Mentreeson, Seven Cents Bay Road. Um, one of my biggest concerns looks like a subdivision, a division. And what I see four lots butting up against my property line with no back lane access or separation or anything. So, that's a concern of mine. I don't understand. I've never seen anything like that before. Um, I don't know. So I kind of oppose it. I think uh, I don't think it would fit. Okay. Looks like we lost Teresa there. Um, well, uh, any, Teresa, you're back. Teresa, we can't hear you. Okay, uh, maybe we'll clear that up later. Does anyone else want to, uh, Brad, go ahead, Brad Weider. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you for giving the opportunity to speak. Um, I just, it's not much more I want to add except for the fact that uh, Kenora is, uh, it has very few industries, tourism being the number one. Um, industries come and go, but the tourism industry is the one that, that stays. Lawrence's Lake uh, is a beautiful place. I've lived here all my life. I, uh, I grew up here and I've enjoyed it. And to have someone to come from outside of our town and make changes to the landscape like this, uh, I think it deeply impacts uh, what uh, what people come here for, which is the beauty and uh, well, the great recreation that is here. Lawrenson's Lake is uh, is is definitely uh, a part of that. Um, there's many tourism industries that come into this lake um, expecting a an eco experience. Um, there's great uh, recreational activities that happen on the lake and surrounding area. I believe that something like this, I understand that the city and the province want to utilize vacant land. 
Um, but I don't think it's in the best interest of the city or the province to utilize the land around a place like this, being Lawrence's Lake. Um, there are other places that you can de develop and uh, take away the nature um, and to make housing. I, I don't think uh, a place that's visible to, uh, to, uh, to the tourists and the other people that enjoy the area uh, around Lawrence's Lake, um, I, I don't think that's that's where it should be. Um, that, like others have said, there's other great places to develop. Um, and uh, in my opinion, Lawrence's Lake's not one of them. Please, I would like to see it kept the way it has been for hundreds of years and uh, for, for my children to enjoy and their children to enjoy. Um, I think it would be a sad mistake for you to take away from that. Um, and I think it would affect, affect not only uh, us, but I think it would affect the greater economy here in Kenora. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, anyone else uh, wishing to speak in opposition? Okay, seeing none. I'll uh, open the floor to the committee members for comments, discussion, and or questions. Uh, Mr. McDougall. Uh, sure. Um, I, when I was going through the uh, documents that were supplied, the application, and maybe this is a one for uh, uh, KRC or uh, I'm not sure, but the, the application didn't have an acquisition date. So am I to believe that this property has not been acquired by the applicant? Oh. <laughs> My... Who's answering that? So just, just to clarify, maybe Kimberly, you can help with this too, but it was in, in the planning report. It was required in July of 2021, um, two months ago. That's correct. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then for uh, Ryan Haynes, uh, Ryan, I like at the beginning of your presentation, you talked about um, you know, one of the objectives for this uh, subdivision was to create more affordable housing in the area. So are, are you talking like more housing or more affordable housing? Like I'm just sort of just trying to check the words there a little bit. So, um, and, and I think looking at, at, the, at the drawings of, of this property, I, I don't think this could be described as, as low income housing. Um, but I think at, at the same time, um, for, for the people who would be looking to purchase these homes, right, it, having a semi-detached does, does reduce some cost. Um, so I, I don't think this, this would, um, and, and by, by the definition, I think of, you know, what, what a affordable housing is, I, I don't think this could be considered likely um, affordable housing using the, the, the definition that, that the federal government uses, but it does provide for people who are in the market for this housing that the semi-detached option does, does make it more affordable for, for them. But um, yeah, this, this is what, what the, um, from the, the drawings and designs I've seen, this, this is not a, a geared to, to low income housing um, plan. If, if that answers your question, John? Yeah, I was just trying to figure out exactly what you're, uh, what you're meaning by like, uh, you know, if it's just more housing or more affordable housing, like, you know, something that uh, would be, you know, taken down that sort of lower income, uh, you know, affordability or, or I was just trying to get a little more detail from you about what your, what your thoughts were. Um, <clears throat> and then so I'm, I'm looking at the, some of the documents. And so the, the plan is, so you've got like lot one is a very small lot at 574 meters. And this probably relates to you, Ryan, um, and or Kim. And you've got, you know, lots of 703 meter, square meters, 871 and 977, and, and a retained lot, which is, the retained lot I see is sort of in more in uh, keeping with the lots that exist there, but the other the other four are 
fairly small. Like, you know, I, I'm just, um, was any consideration given to, to having maybe fewer lots and, you know, out of that existing one lot? And I, I don't know if I'm entitled to ask that question, but I just, you know, at 574, when the neighboring lots are sort of uh, north, like in the 2200 to almost 4,000 square meter, it seems like it's uh, not uh, sort of much of a fit, just an observation. And and I guess, John, I, I can't really speak to that, the, the decisions made by the developer and, and the economics around, um, you know, how how to make this economical and viable? I um, I, I, I apologize. These, these are are the designs I think that the developer felt um, could be, be viable, right? In terms of the, the market and and you know what what costs are. I think. Okay. Um, and if this is Shuchuk, if you, if I can ask you a question, if you're still with us. Uh, yes. I'm just trying to get a sense of when this uh, Sunset Bay uh, was put together. Uh, I, I thought I heard you say 1979. Uh, no. No? Um, I think our these properties were for sale in, my husband is here, he can. It was about 1978. 78, sorry. Okay. okay. I, I don't have any more questions right now. and. Uh, maybe other committee members have questions, but uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm good now, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Mr. Barr? A couple of questions. There's a very extensive um, shoreline road allowance, which loops across, uh, across the locks or across lot one on the east. And north side and goes across, I think it's number seven. Um, the, which is, uh, what's, does anybody know what the setback is for that road allowance? Because it's not identified here. It's shown as unpatented land. Brian? Um, yes, John. Um, that, that'll be a 20 meter setback from the high water mark. So 66 feet. Correct, yes. Like, what we used to call a chain. Yep. Um, and, you, and you don't have a price point on, on the dwellings from lot two to lot five. I, I assume a price point on lot one will be a little higher than lot two to lot five. Yeah, I'm, I'm not I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if um, even, yeah, the, the developers aware of that at, at this time, what, what the prices will be. But the back of the... The back of the dwellings on lot of the duplexes of lot two and three and lot four and five will look towards the back of the dwellings uh, on Sunset Bay, correct? And not looking, there's, you're not looking into the front yard, you're looking into the backyard. You're looking in the garages and the driveways, correct? Sorry, I, I think these, um, I, my understanding is, is the semi-detached units will face uh, transmitter road. So okay. They'll be looking across at Lakeside Baptist Church is, is the way they'll face. That'll be the front of, of, of the, it'll be the backyard that um, okay. is facing. Um, All right. Um, I'll one question I have, uh, the, I looked at the rationale from Mr. Rosenberg on the, of the OMB in March 2000. Um, my question is, that particular um, application for a severance, was it the same property as this property? Does anybody know? No, it was for a, a neighboring property to sever one of the neighboring properties in, in two. It was, it was not for this. It was a separate, was that, separate property. Was that particular property the square property across on the other side of Sunset Bay? Um, it was for one of, one of the other lots on, on Sunset Bay, correct? Yes, John, you're right. It was for the, it's currently the wider property. Okay. Okay, but it was not for this property. No. Okay. Uh, 
Lot two to five would be considered back lots, not waterfront lots. The only waterfront lot would be lot one. Correct. Um, yeah, there are no new waterfront lots created. There's still just one waterfront lot and the other four are back lots, correct? Okay. Uh, for, for the city, is there, um, is there any option for the city to regulate the, the, the construction of the duplexes so they conform? Um, I guess you don't, we wouldn't even know if they're one story or two story is all we talk about 10 meter maximum height. Uh, no, no bigger than that. I guess there's no way to to restrict the the construction of the dwellings to more more or less conform with the surrounding area. Uh, under the current uh, under the current uh, regulations, uh, you know anybody that, uh, as with any property, anybody that uh, proposes a dwelling that complies with the the zoning bylaw requirements is permitted to construct within those constraints. Uh, when we get to considering the zoning amendment, uh, there is always the option of site-specific uh, requirements. Um, you know, and perhaps that would be, might be a better time to discuss that than under the subdivision. But uh, um, and site-specific provisions would be, you know, I, you know, I guess it would, I'd, ha I'd have to reserve my comments for what was being proposed. Okay, uh, just for clarity, isn't there a sidewalk along Highway 17 on the south side to the curb? Uh, there is one along the south side. Uh, I, I prox I clo it's close to the entrance of Transmitter Road. I, I don't have that map uh, pulled up right now, but it, it's, it ends right around the entrance to Transmitter Road. Okay, other than that, so all the lots would meet the, meet the zoning uh, bylaw for R2 residential, including side yard, front yard, backyard. Yeah, regardless of the outcome of area. the zoning, regardless of the outcome of the zoning amendment, uh, these the proposed lots confirm with the current R1 zoning, uh, and if the zoning amendment is approved, they also confirm to the uh, proposed R2 zoning. And they're all serviced. Or they would yes. all be serviced. Yeah, we require that. Okay, no further questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Barr. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, firstly, for you, Ryan, um, can you clarify whether these units are going to be rentals or for sale? I, I, I'm not, I'm not getting a clear answer here from anybody. Sounds like they're for sale, but I'm not sure. My, my understanding is, is the intent is for them, them. What was that? What was the answer? Oh, sorry. My, my understanding is, is the intent is for them, them to be sold. Um, I think Fred writes on, you can correct me if, if I'm wrong there, Fred. Okay. Um, and then my next question and again, some clarification in order here. Um, either Kevin or, or Ryan or both of you can answer this. I'm looking at the site plan, and I notice there's a the water service for the house on lot one goes down the transmitter road and is serviced separately. Yet you're servicing the four semi-detached units through an easement off Sunset Bay. I guess my question is, why wouldn't all five lots be serviced from the transmitter road with individual services like we would normally do. I I, I can probably address that uh, you know, from uh, conversations with the uh, property owner over the summer. Um, the city's requirement was that there be connections to the existing services at uh, at uh, Sunset Bay Road. Uh, it's at the discretion of the developer as to how they feel it's most affordable or efficient for them to uh, extend those services. Uh, the extension will be at the, the cost of the developer uh, and we will work, you know, where, where easements are required, maybe we will, or where they cross other properties to make those uh, economical, we will require easements uh, where they choose to use the city right of way, uh, which is uh, sort of a more traditional uh, route than, uh, uh, than they're they free to do so. Are you, are you saying that it's the developer's decision? 
Uh, it's our requirement that they connect to, to sewer and water, uh, how they do so. You know, there are some requirements, uh, you know, for sewer, we do require grinder pumps uh, where, the, where the connection is below the elevation of the main it's connecting to. So we're not sure about lots four and five. They may not, they may be able to use a gravity feed uh, directly for sewer. It looks like definitely lots one to three will be, uh, have to use grinder pumps. Uh, and usually with grinder pumps, uh, the straightest line is the, is the most efficient. Uh, as far as water, which is flowing downhill, there's probably a lot more flexibility there. Uh, gravity, uh, you know, whether you take a more securitous route or not, the, the gravity is going to work uh, to the advantage of any extension of water services. Okay, I'm, I'm not the expert. It just seems odd to me, that's all. Um, okay, I have no further questions. Um, so with that... Um, May I have one more question? I'm uh, sorry, I forgot to ask. Speaking, it. It's uh, Tracy, Tracy Wider. Yeah, Tracy Wider. Okay, you have a quick question. Go ahead. Um, now, is this a minor variance or a major variance? This is not a variance. This is a. Uh, this is a application for a plan of subdivision. My understanding through reading through the literature is that you have to apply under either either a minor or a, my, a major variance because it's changing um, zoning, depending on how you're applying. And it would seem to me that this would be applying for um, a major variance to an already established zone. Uh, I could refer that to Mr. Sumner. Uh, variances are required where the provisions of the zoning bylaw can't be met. Uh, as proposed, the current subdivision is compliant with all requirements of the R1 zone, uh, specifically in regards to lot frontage and lot area. Uh, if they are proposing lots that were smaller than what is permitted in the R1 zone, then uh, a variance would be required, but uh, that is not the case. Uh, may, I, may I speak? I'm Ken Ames. I, I, you're confusing me totally because you say there's not a variance and yet you're making it a variance because you're switching it from R1 to R2. R2 says they can have a building 60 feet tall there. 60 feet. That is just totally, totally ridiculous compared to the other buildings that are in the subdivision. Nobody here's got a house over 20 feet tall and yet R2 can go to 60 feet tall. That is the letter I got from you can go 30 meters. You explain that, please. Thank you, Kevin. Yes. So, uh, following the, the 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 consideration of this application for subdivision, the next item on the agenda is the application for zoning bylaw amendment. Uh, it is under that application that uh, the consideration for amendment of the zoning from R one to R two will be considered. Uh, since these properties do conform with both the R one and R two zone. Uh, there's no variance required to the R2 zone. Uh, yes, the R2 zone does uh, require or does uh, allow for certain uh, things that the R1 doesn't, uh, such as or mo most specifically in this uh, case, the uh, construction of semi-detached homes. Uh, but, uh, and, and yes, there, there are uh, greater house, uh, height, uh, 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 greater, <laughs> sorry, uh, higher, uh, heights are permitted under the R2 zone. Uh, as far as the, the intended height of the proposed dwellings, uh, that would be something for the applicant uh, to speak to their vision since they didn't indicate, uh, uh, I don't think the, the height of the proposed dwellings in the, in the description, they just had the square footage. Okay, thank you. And, and just for clarity, our, uh, my understanding, and I've got it up in front of me here is in the R2 R2 zone, a maximum building height is, is 10 meters or, or 30 feet, just, just for some clarity for, for Mr. Ames there. Yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned that too. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, may I ask the Secretary Treasurer to read out the motion? Yes. Recommendation that the creation of four new lots be approved as proposed in the site plan, as the proposed site plan meets the criteria set out in Section 5124 of the Planning Act. And that draft approval is hereby given by the Planning Advisory Committee. The draft approval applies to the site plan circulated as file D102112 for the subject property located on the northeast corner of the intersection of Transmitter Road and Sunset Bay Road, being pin number 42168 0592. 
It is further recommended that approval be subject to the conditions as outlined in, in, in the planning report and as read by the planner. Thank you. I may ask for a mover and a seconder. I'll move. Mr. Barr, seconder. Here. Seeing none. Okay. Motion has been de motion defeated. Can I ask what does that mean? What did you just say? I don't understand what you're doing here. I've never been to a council meeting. I know nothing. So what does that mean? What do that, Mr. Chair? So, so the motion that I can speak to that, Mr. Chair, if you'd like. Okay. Go okay. ahead. Go ahead. The motion speak. that was put on the floor was for draft approval. We had a, a mover being chair member, Mr. John Barr. However, the committee did not put forward a seconder to move that motion. So that motion was defeated. The motion was defeated? Is that what I understood you to say? The motion was defeated to approve draft plan of subdivision, correct? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, if you'd like me to continue. Yes, go ahead. To the agent, Mr. Ryan Haynes and Mrs. Kim Maya. So as there was no seconder for that motion, it was defeated. Uh, I will send out the decision by Thursday this week. It will be subject to the 20 day appeal period, which will take us to October 13th. Okay. Um, so, uh, question, Mr. Sumner, to uh, the planner, uh, how does how does that relate to our next application? Well, it, I would uh, put that to the applicant as to whether they wish to consider with uh, continue with it. Uh, uh, it would appear to complicate the the rezoning as the rezoning was tied to the proposed lots that were envisioned. But it, it's not for me to speak on behalf of the applicant uh, as to whether they wish this to be considered or not. Kimberly, any thoughts on that? Um, if we could just have a moment. Okay, um, how about we take a break here? Take a, uh, we'll take a little five minute break and uh, we'll come back to the meeting at uh, 8.52.
Okay, it's 8.02. I guess we'll uh, start the meeting back up. Ryan, are you with us? I am, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Kimberly, um, you're with us? Yeah. I am. Okay. Our request would, sorry, our request with respect to the rezoning application, would that it be tabled to the October Planning Advisory Committee meeting on the basis that we don't feel that there is uh, sufficient members present in order to properly deal with it? Kevin, what's your thoughts on that? Um, you know, it's it's the right of the applicant to uh, request that it be tabled. Uh, it is the decision of the uh, uh, of the committee itself as to whether uh, it should be tabled. Uh, the, the The committee does have quorum uh, as required under the the bylaw establishing the committee. Uh, so the, there is uh, it is expected that that uh, should the committee meet quorum that it can continue to function as a committee. Uh, regardless of the uh, whether how, how far in excess, whether the quorum is exceeded or, or not. Okay, yeah, given we had a quorum, well, we can still table it till next month if that's what the uh, applicants choose to do. Yes, Mr. that Barr? would be our request. Mr. Barr? Uh, do we need a motion to uh, table towards next month? If, if that's uh, if so, I'll make a motion that uh, file D14 21 08, amendment to the zoning bylaw, um, be uh, delayed up uh, to here until next month's meeting. Okay, seconder. Okay, Mr. McDougall seconds that. Melissa, all in favor? Carried. Thank you, Ms. Maya. So we will defer your application D142108 and it will be on the agenda of the October Planning Advisory Committee meeting. If there's any supplementary information that you would like circulated prior to that meeting, please connect with us. Um, but I'm sure we'll be in contact before then. Oh, if I could also note to all the members of the public on the call as well, you will receive notification of that rescheduled hearing. Okay, that concludes our applications for tonight. Um, next item on the agenda is new business. And uh, I guess that's uh, you on the floor, Adam. I don't have any, uh, uh, any uh, items to, to bring forward at this time. There's nothing new with the zoning bylaw and uh, not at this time. I know uh, Kevin perhaps can provide a little bit more information. We are currently moving towards the um, uh, a, uh, the or the draft official plan has been submitted to the ministry. Um, so we are now working on uh, um, the, the the draft zoning bylaw, to which uh, um, eventually there will be a combined public meeting for for both of those items. And Kevin, feel free to add in or clarify in some of those points. Yeah, uh, not much to add. Uh, it is with the ministry. Uh, we're anticipating, uh, we've been told to expect a slightly longer review period than what is traditional, uh, owing to the unique circumstances that everybody finds themselves operating under. But uh, we're hoping that uh, we'll have that completed before the end of the year and uh, can move forward with uh, putting final touches on the official plan and getting that out to the public uh, uh, with the benefit of uh, hopefully uh, the ministry's uh, endorsement uh, and we have uh, started work on the zoning bylaw the first step is uh, comprehensive internal review that, that uh, we conducted and uh, and then uh, our consultants have been working on that as well our technical advisory committee is planning to meet uh, about uh, just over a week from now uh, to for their first uh, meeting to discuss the zoning bylaw and having now be, being able to move forward from the official plan. Uh, up until this point, the focus was on the official plan. Uh, uh, so uh, we'll be working with our uh, advisory committee and uh, and uh, and stakeholders as far as uh, uh, starting that work of drafting a new zoning bylaw uh, 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 over the next few months. Okay. 
Uh, did you want to add in there, Adam, anything about uh, in-person meetings coming up or are we going to continue on with our format as we are? Uh, I'm still uh, comfortable with uh, having these uh, the virtual meetings. It's up to the committee if uh, they want to uh, kind of relook at um, uh, um, in-person meetings. But I think just uh, given the circumstances, uh, there's no current rush uh, to get back in person. Any comments from members on that, Mr. Barr? Yeah, I agree with Adam. I, even if we went to in-person meetings, we'd have to wear masks probably anyhow. And I don't really I just came back from Ottawa yesterday and I'm wearing a mask for four hours and it was a little much. <laughs> yeah. So I'm good, I'm good with this format. Yeah, I, I am too. How about you, John? No, I agree, uh, Mr. Chair, that it's probably for now. Um, you know, we're not getting any worse or any better, I don't think. So I think it's probably just uh, as simple to uh, be able to continue with the with the uh, uh, Zoom type uh, platform for now and see how things go over the next couple of months. Has, has the city changed uh, any of their uh, meeting formats, Adam, with other committees? Uh, not to, to my understanding for the other committees, um, but uh, I do know council has moved a bit of a hybrid in terms of uh, being in person as well as just having a public access via uh, a Zoom link. So uh, it is a little bit complicated, but, uh, um, you know, for our committees, I think, um, you know, we have some flexibility on the approach given the changes to the terms of reference. So I'm in no, um, you know, rush to get back. I think this has been, especially given if we're looking at restrictions to, uh, um, you know, public participation. I think Zoom is still the, you know, a platform to which uh, enables a, a broad amount of people to, to participate, so. Okay. Um, I guess that uh, brings the uh, meeting agenda to an end. Uh, John, you want to? Uh... I'll move to adjourn. Okay, thank you. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Everybody. Take care. Okay, we'll see you all next month. Bye-bye. Night, everyone. Good night.